Hello and welcome to the debate. I'm your host Sana Makbul with you at BTV World. In today's show, we will be taking a look at two important stories. The first is in reference to what has been going on in Pakistan for quite some time now. Of course, the spike in terrorist activities has been a huge concern for Pakistan, and especially since the announcement from the TTP that has ended ceasefire and also encouraged its attackers to go ahead uh, with its forces uh, throughout the country uh, since they believe uh, that the uh, military uh, and the institutions of Pakistan did not respect the ceasefire. This announcement is of course concerning uh, considering what is already going on in Afghanistan, especially uh, the attack on the Pakistani embassy uh, in Kabul in which the charge affairs was also targeted. He is safe, uh, but the attack has of course been condemned uh, by the top leadership in Pakistan, including the prime minister, the president and the foreign minister. And they've also asked for immediate inquiry into the incident. Uh, the Afghan Taliban officials have said that they will be taking a look into this and will be making sure that whoever is responsible uh, will be brought to task but um, of course that remains to be seen uh, and in terms of what is going on within the country and its ability to protect the uh, the other countries uh, and its own soil from being used against them uh, is something that is still a concern and assurance that was provided by the Afghan Taliban uh, but is still something that has not been internationally met uh, the US on the other side has also talked about uh, TTP militants al-Qaeda militants and other Others and designated four of them uh, as a special terrorist uh, terrorists and they have talked about this as part of their commitment uh, to working towards anti-terrorism efforts uh, outside the region and specifically in Afghanistan and the neighborhood as well um, this of course also includes the TTB second in command as well the Roji who was uh, responsible for quite some attacks and uh, the attacks that have spiked uh, within Pakistan since uh, the um, Afghan Taliban have gained power in the US troop withdrawal happened about more than a year ago. Uh, this is something that we'll be taking a look at in terms of where Pakistan stands strategically, politically and diplomatically. Uh, something that the foreign minister has reiterated in the past that we need to reevaluate and see where we stand, what our policies should be like and whether or not we're going to go ahead with the dialogue and even if we are gaining any ground in that aspect. That is going to be the focus of our first segment of the show today. The next one is going to focus on the political dynamics of the country uh, with the statements coming in from the PTI's leadership. What we saw on the 26th of November uh, with regards to the dissolution of assemblies uh, still hasn't been met by any action. In fact, what the PTI chairman has now called for is for the government to sit down and have talks and that uh, that is something that needs to happen and that the current political setup should be going towards that option instead of allowing or letting the PTI go ahead with the dissolution of assemblies, which the PTI chairman says uh, will be on 66% uh, of the seats within Pakistan. And so he believes that a call for early elections is something that should happen. Of course, the PDM has uh, repeatedly talked about how the elections will be on time, uh, but they have also now talked about that finally, perhaps the PTI chairman is uh, talking about political aspects and going ahead with a political option, something uh, that of course has been, uh, th that has been asked of him for quite some time now uh, but with regards uh, to what uh, where the PTI currently stands especially in the aftermath of the long march in the aftermath of uh, the new chief of army staff being appointed uh, this is currently where we stand where there is still no announcement of when the dissolution of assemblies is going to happen uh, but there is this extension of an offer of talks at the same time we also know that the CM Punjab and CMKP have said that they will be going ahead with the dissolution of assemblies at the call of the party chief so that is going to be the focus of our second segment of the show today. For this and more, as usual, in the studios, I've been joined by senior analyst Farooq Patafi. And today, we've also been joined in the studios by Mr. Sefullah Masood, who's uh, the president of the Research Center. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sefullah, for being a part of the debate in the studios. We've also been joined online by Mr. Sayyid Adnan Bukhari, who's assistant professor of Homeland Security program at Dublin Academy in Abu Dhabi, and also by Mr. Anwar Iqbal, who's the senior journalist, and we'll be joined by him soon, too. Um, with regards to, of course, the current situation, in terms of where we stand, uh, the, the aspect of terrorism is a huge concern in Pakistan. And let me start with you, Mr. Sefullah, considering uh, the attack that has happened in the, um, uh, in the Pakistan embassy in Kabul. Uh, this is of serious concern to us, and we need to, of course, be able to tackle 
and protect our uh, a diplomatic presence and our citizenship within Afghanistan. But more than that, it also points towards um, the, the threat or the potential of this harm going perhaps beyond the border and something that we have experienced as well. So in terms of how we deal with it, where do you think Pakistan stands at the moment with its current strategies? Are we moving in the right direction? See, Pakistan has so far dealt with it quite uh, maturely, I would say, as a responsible state should uh, in the context of what is happening in the region, in the context of uh, uh, the compulsions that we have, political compulsions, security compulsions that we face in this region. Uh, they have uh, called uh, uh, the Afghan ambassador or Afghan charge affairs for an explanation. I'm sure they have also raised this concern with the Kabul government. And uh, you know, despite the rumors that perhaps Pakistan was calling its diplomatic staff back from uh, Kabul and Kandahar back to Islamabad, they have also said that uh, nothing of this sort uh, has been discussed or is in the offing. So I would say all of that is very mature. Then recently, our foreign minister, uh, foreign minister for state, Hina Rabani Khar, was in Kabul, and I'm sure she also raised uh, Pakistan security, primarily Pakistan security concerns. Uh, with Afghanistan in the light of the promises that they had made under the Doha agreement, uh, the highlight of which was their promise that uh, the Afghan soil would not be used by non-state actors against uh, neighboring states or states anywhere else in the world. So I would say that so far Pakistan's response has been quite mature, but uh, I'm sure they need to uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, bring into play the leverages that we still have with Afghanistan uh, talk to the Kabul government more, see you know who within the Afghan Taliban is better allied with Pakistan, you know perhaps uh, make their demands uh, with them, highlight their demands with them more than with groups that perhaps are not, uh, you know as 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 uh, 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 you know responsive to Pakistan's needs, uh, security needs right now. Right, absolutely. Um, Farooq, considering this particular situation and also what uh, the, the recent development has been from the U.S.'s side, uh, where they have uh, talked about certain militants also part of the TTP, um, this they claim, of course, is part of their efforts towards making sure uh, that the Afghanistan soil is not used against any other territory. But in terms of uh, real protection that this can actually offer to Pakistan specifically, is that something of value in terms of uh, our uh, dealing with the TTP in particular? Uh, right, uh, Sana. Uh, uh, remember the other day we were talking about how Pakistan and the U.S. Uh, throughout the uh, war on terror have been on the on the same page when it comes to TTP. Uh, you know, in the past also the U.S. has included uh, such elements from TTP on its watch list or most wanted list, and this time to uh, to uh, they have added four more names. One of them is a recruiter, and another is a treasury. Uh, but having said that, uh, this is of uh, uh, nominal value at this time uh, because uh, TTP does not operate, uh, you know, outside these two countries, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, they don't have any, any uh, bank accounts in the U.S., so to speak. Uh, of course, if uh, some country, some third party is going to send money to these accounts or any person uh, related to it, they can face some kind of pins and action. Uh, but apart from that, I don't think that it is going to bring a lot on the table. Uh, perhaps it can push further uh, pressure on Afghan Taliban because they, of course, are seeking normalization of their uh, or a re a recognition of their administration in Kabul. Uh, but again, because they are so already so sanctioned, uh, you don't think that uh, you have the kind of lever or leverage that might be needed over there. Uh, regarding what happened in Kabul, I t uh, let me st uh, first of all condemn it because it was a sad incident, a uh, tragic incident. Uh, uh, you know, a uh, sepai is uh, struggling uh, for his life la last I checked. You know, uh, there was a time when it was said that the world of civilization is a rich man's burden. Now it seems that it is a poor man's burden because it is mostly the poor who actually succumb to these attacks or similar kind of conditions. Uh, uh, again, let me refresh the memory of every, everybody who is watching. Last time we discussed Afghanistan, I pointed out that uh, within Afghan uh, Taliban ranks, uh, there seem to be many dissensions and uh, there seems to be a lot of fragmentation. That also creates a kind of uh, uh, you know, blind spot in action. 
and that's why such uh, incidents can take place. Uh, so far, what we know about this attack, uh, you know, it was a lone shooter who somehow managed to uh, actually come close to the residential quarters. So uh, it is very difficult to know whether it was TDP, Al Qaeda, or any other organization of the sort, uh, but uh, or whether it was a lone wolf attack. But security being laxed uh, from the uh, Kabul authorities is a serious concern. Uh, I've seen the statement coming from Kabul, which condemns it con uh, categorically, and then there's a statement that they are going to take action and investigate as well. Mm. This is exactly what Pakistan has asked for, and let us wait and see. Absolutely. Um, Mr. Adnan, when we take a look at this situation and the ones prior to this as well, uh, there is, of course, a lot that uh, that is expected of the Afghan Taliban authorities currently in Afghanistan. Um, at the end of the day, of course, the assurances were given in terms of the protection uh, to other countries that the assault won't be used. But this is a real threat or a problem that the Afghanistan Taliban uh, also face themselves. And so when we look at the situation, how much of this uh, can be realistically expected? of them? Are they capable or even willing? Um, what sort of hindrances exist in terms of actually uh, enabling the Afghan Taliban authorities uh, to go ahead with the kind of statements they make? They do talk about uh, condemnations, they do talk about action being taken, but in terms of any real protection, can we rely on the Afghan Taliban authorities? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, the situation in Afghanistan is very tenuous, it's very fragile. And the Afghan regime has not been able to uh, control the country, run the country in a way, especially from the security point of view. And there are multiple actors that are, in, are operating in Afghanistan. Uh, there are uh, multiple non-state actors. Al-Qaeda is one, Daesh is one. Uh, then we have the TDP. And uh, as far as the, the type of, uh, for example, capacity that the Taliban have, the Afghan Taliban have, uh, I don't think they have that type of capacity. They have the resources to basically maintain law and order in the country. I can just take you back to, for example, November, where there was an incident on the Chaman border. You see, the, the Afghan government and the Chaman border was closed for three weeks almost, and the Afghan government or the, the regime was not able to uh, trace the person, basically, put him, basically, bring him to justice. Uh, similarly, today we have seen another incident that was an attack on a, on a, on a diplomat um, of a neighboring country. Uh, similarly, we have seen, for example, another attack on madrasas in Afghanistan. That two day, the attack that took place yesterday on the madrasa in Samanjan. So, in a way, we can say that the Afghan uh, regime basically is uh, largely failing to uh, meet its uh, responsibilities or shoulder its responsibilities, uh, which is basically requ required by the international community. Uh, right. And uh, Mr. Zephala, this is, of course, something uh, that is of concern. If they are failing to meet their commitments, uh, then um, when we move ahead, and as Farouk was talking about, if we're already uh, sanctioned the country, if there's already so many restrictions, if they're not being internationally recognized, um, what else remains in terms of dealing with the threat that emerges out of Afghanistan? This has gone uh, uh, longer than a year uh, uh, up till now, and so possibly can go far longer in the future as well. Um, and if we don't have the kind of uh, commitments uh, uh, that are followed up by the Afghan Taliban, uh, then what will the world deal with in terms of the threat of terrorism that emerges? I mean, the world as, uh, you know, the non-state actors Adnan just mentioned, that is a concern not just for the rest of the world, but for Pakistan, because we are their immediate neighbors. They, as he mentioned, there is Al-Qaeda there, there is IS there, and, you know, uh, there are other actors, you know, uh, yeah. emerging, yeah, emerging in, uh, in, in, the, in the north of Afghanistan that can jeopardize the Taliban's ability to deal with the security situation in Pakistan to the world, to its neighbor's satisfaction even more. So keeping that in mind, I would say that rather than sanctioning them more uh, economically or through other kinds of sanctions, you know, uh, perhaps, you know, uh, Taliban are uh, basically running a country that is transitioning for, from war into uh, somewhat of a peace-like situation. So uh, I would urge more cooperation from especially the neighbors, Pakistani side, uh, and the world in general, especially, you know, the U.S. by uh, uh, perhaps conditionally releasing the funds that they're holding. 
uh, that basically belong to the Afghan people, not to the Taliban regime. Under certain conditions, if they are helped economically, perhaps they would be able to uh, uh, divert their attentions to uh, you know, the issues that are closer to uh, you know, uh, the interest of the world and that of its neighbors, especially us, Pakistan. Right. Uh, let me also welcome in the debate Mr. Anwar Iqbal, who's a senior journalist, and he's joined us on, in the debate. Um, considering the current situation um, and the, the talk of what the uh, threat of terrorism has in terms of what Pakistan needs to be concerned about, uh, there is, of course, the fact that the Afghan Taliban regime currently uh, in Afghanistan is, is something that we'll, we'll have to take a look into in terms of whether or not this could be uh, a facilitation uh, that can be expected from them. But currently, if we look at the situation, the kind of humanitarian crisis that exists, the kind of uh, threat of terrorism that emerges out of Afghanistan, and the fact that this is the Afghan Taliban regime that is currently in power and that there is perhaps no chance of international recognition in the recent future, what sort of a potential threat are we dealing with in the name of Afghanistan and whether or not there is an option because as Mr. Sefullah was saying there is still just reeling out of decades of war um, and perhaps the options of any sort of military interference is not something that is going to be good for either Afghanistan or any other country. So what else can be done internationally to help us in this fight against counterterrorism? Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, let me ask you uh, a brief question. When you say the question of military intervention, are you suggesting that Pakistan should intervene literally in Afghanistan? Mr. Mr. Anwar, can you repeat that, please? Yes. Are you suggesting that Pakistan should interfere militarily in, in Afghanistan? Not at all. I'm not suggesting anything. I'm asking no. whether or not no. the I military interference be, is an option, be. considering the fact that the international recognition or okay. the assurances given okay. by the Afghan Taliban regime are nowhere near in the future. That is something as a possibility. I, I, so if we I, don't and I, if we cannot afford you. military option, what else exists on the table? Yeah, okay. Good. Thank you very much. First of all, as you said, there is no question of Pakistan's military interference in Afghanistan. That will be a huge mistake, and I think uh, uh, people in Islamabad and in Rawalpindi realize that, and I think Pakistan is not even considering sending its troops into Afghanistan because that is Afghanistan's history. You are Afghanistan's friends as long as you do not have uh, your troops on their soil. Once you send your troops, you are an enemy. And then all of them slowly and gradually turn against you, and it becomes a nightmare scenario for for uh, the forces that are involved. So, of course, Pakistan is not thinking of any military intervention in Afghanistan. Number one. Now, is America going to do it? That again, no. They have learned their lesson. They stayed there for 20 years, and they realized that they, if they wanted, they could have stayed for 20 more years. But they realized that even if, even if they stayed for like 40 years there, we're not going to get anything. I mean, that this fight will simmer on. It will not flare up into a major war. We just simmer on, and there will be no return. Right, absolutely. So uh, Iqbal Sab, I understand true. that. My question was not whether or, whether or not this is an option for Pakistan or the so U.S., what, or if they'll the actually American, consider that. My point so, is that this, because this is not an option, what else exists on the table? Okay. The, uh, the, the only option that can work in Afghanistan is to develop a regional understanding, persuading China, Pakistan, and India, particularly Pakistan and India, to cooperate with each other and to make them understand that, okay, each of these countries, like China, Pakistan, and India, have their interests in Afghanistan and want to protect their interests, but they cannot succeed as long as they keep fighting each other for controlling parts or groups in Afghanistan. Is that going to happen? I don't think so, because Indians feel bitter. They feel that they have been defeated in Afghanistan. They tried to keep Pakistan out of Afghanistan, and they did not succeed. And that was, let's admit, that that was a major victory for Afghanistan. So Indians are not going to cooperate. So what can the United States do? The United States, I think, has enough influence on India now that it can make India 
see the light, it can make an, uh, India understand that they will not get anything but continue, continuing this confrontation with Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, similarly, China, which uh, is welcome in Afghanistan, it was welcomed by the previous Afghan government, it is welcomed by this Afghan government as well. China also can play a very major role in promoting peace and stability in Afghanistan. But above all, what we need to do is to make the Afghan people, particularly the the factor rulers in Kabul, the Taliban, that look, enough is enough. You fought for like 20 plus years and now you are in power. So start, start acting like a government, not as, as, as a guerrilla group or not as, an, as a party in the opposition. And that happens to all armed struggles that have been in, in the battlefield for so long. They learn how to fight, but they never learn how to, how to govern. And the major problem I see in Afghanistan is that the Taliban do not know how to govern that country. They need to learn that. And also the Americans uh, need to be a little more lenient. They need to reconsider the sanctions. They need to release some of the assets uh, that they have confiscated. All right, um, Adva Sahib, let me, let me shift the focus back a little bit to Pakistan. And Farooq, this is something that you have uh, talked about a lot, that that is one of your major concerns. And of course, uh, in terms of what Pakistan faces, what we can deal with and how we can protect our own citizens is perhaps our priority yeah. and what we need to look at. But can we do that regardless of what goes on in Afghanistan, regardless of what the Afghan Taliban regime is capable of or can or cannot do um, in terms of our threats within uh, with the country, the, the TTP? and other organizations and also those emanating from Afghanistan, can there be a strategy, a way forward that at least protects our own borders and what goes on within them? Uh, right, uh, Sana, and uh, this is an important question. Uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan have been sharing this border, which has been really porous, uh, even though we ha tried to harden it. But recently, in November, we saw what became of that as well. Mm -hmm. Even Afghan authorities did not stop anybody when uh, a kilometer uh, of white fence was actually dismantled and the other party actually walked, with, uh, walked away with it. Uh, having said that, uh, 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 let me start in uh, Kabul, uh, Afghanistan, because it is important. We keep on referring to the Afghan Taliban government as uh, the interim government or transition to a more stable Afghanistan. But I'm really skeptical of that. Uh, why? Because if you remember what, uh, what was uh, Mullah Umar's government called uh, until it was there, it was also called interim government, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, you can call a government by any name possible, but it will either be in charge or in control of circumstances or not at all. Um, I, I do agree with uh, certain aspects that uh, you know, um, uh, uh, there's this uh, uh, razor called Han Hanlon's uh, razor, which say a states never attribute to malice what can be explained by stupidity or incompetence, right? Mm. So I think that there, there might be this lack of capacity on their part to enforce, uh, uh, you know, uh, law and order uh, or uh, security within their own confines. Uh, but that is also a huge concern for the regional powers as well. At the start of their takeover, there was a, a kind of a regional interaction forum uh, between all the neighbors of Afghanistan, and we kept on participating and doing a lot. Uh, uh, perhaps it is time to revive that as well. And then, as you pointed out, uh, charity begins at home. When uh, you talk about Pakistan, Pakistan has fought a 20 year war against terrorism, and we have lost somewhere around 80,000 people. Uh, Whatever gains were there, very uh, because we started engaging Afghan, uh, uh, through Afghanistan, Afghan Taliban, we started engaging TDP. We ended up, uh, you know, uh, creating more blind spots. For example, all these pickets, security pickets in the tribal areas, former tribal areas, that were removed suddenly. Mm -hmm. oh, somebody has to actually answer answer that as well. Answer to that as well. So uh, once again, uh, let me remind everybody that I've been th what I've been saying since the very start that Pakistani security uh, and Pakistani authorities will have to take up this matter, and uh, perhaps uh, the Cabinet com Committee on National Security will have to convene and take all these parts or moving parts into uh, cognizance and uh, uh, come up uh, with some kind of resolution. 
Uh, similarly, we have to actually see the parliament also taking uh, action on this because it is a serious concern. Last time it was uh, the parliament which greenlit uh, the okay. negotiations that were going on. Now the negotiations are, have ended with TDP. Why is it that my own citizens are still being harassed by terrorist or non-state actors in the former tribal areas? Right, absolutely. And in line with this, uh, Mr. Adnan, uh, the, the foreign minister spoke about the uh, need to re-evaluate uh, what has been done in the past. And of course, what Farooq is also pointing out in terms of accountability and answering important questions. And of course, our political setup and the parliament taking uh, uh, control as to what sort of decisions are going to be made and what sort uh, of way forward will be the best in this regard. But is that something that we can truly expect given the current political scenario as well, the kind of instability? that Pakistan has been facing. Um, this is, of course, a major concern. Um, and in terms of uh, our need to reevaluate, do we have the courage to do so? Uh, first of all, Pakistan's patience is running very thin. Uh, it has been now more than one year with the Afghan regime, and they have not been delivering on almost every, every basically, request that Pakistan or, or the international community is putting to them. Uh, and, uh, and we have seen, basically, attacks cross-border attacks, on check posts, on fences, basically, and most importantly, uh, all of our uh, demands regarding TDP, for example, the Taliban regime has not been able to uh, accommodate, for example, in any way, Pakistan's demands so far. And when TDP has called off the ceasefire two days ago, the first attack they conducted, in a way, the suicide attack, I would call it, was basically in Pakistan. Like, Pakistan's uh, options are, uh, I would say that, international community and Pakistan still has other options as well. Afghan Taliban has to basically listen to the international community, otherwise options are still there with the, almost all the neighboring countries and with Pakistan as well. And Afghanistan, as I said already, that it's a very tenuous country right now. It's very fragile. Uh, if, uh, if, uh, uh, if Ashraf Ghani's 250,000 troops could not control Afghanistan with all international support, Afghanistan Taliban with basically a meager force and a crude force basically will not be able to control this big country. Uh, with such diverse so therefore what i want to say is that uh, afghan taliban has to seriously basically uh, take into consideration uh, the requests of pakistan uh, and uh, this uh, tdp thing is going to be the break off basically if the violence increases in pakistan there will be more uh, more voices basically anger within pakistan and establishment uh, the pakistani government in fact will be under immense pressure to review its uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's approach basically towards Afghanistan. Uh, right, absolutely. Um, uh, Mr. Saifullah, considering that uh, th there was much debate in terms of whether or not we should even begin dialogue uh, with an organization such as the TTP, um, and we haven't gained much at all out of the, uh, the few conversations that were held, and of course the ceasefire has also ended now, and there have been statements coming in um, uh, repeatedly over the past as well that have harmed the country. Um, in terms of our way forward, is that an option that we can still consider in the future? I think we went about it in the wrong manner. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our Afghan policy has uh, almost always been, especially after 9-11, since 9-11, it has been the sole preserve of our armed forces with uh, little to no input from our civilian setup, which continues to be the case. Regardless of which government has been uh, in power in Islamabad, they have uh, the wisdom prevailing among them has been to leave it to the military to deal with. And this continues to be the case. And this also uh, was an issue in the talks that were held with the Taliban. There was hardly any civilian input. I mean, forget about uh, taking input from those sitting here in Islamabad or elsewhere in the country. The, the, the war zone, uh, the tribal areas of Pakistan, uh, which are the primary stakeholders in all that is going on in that area, even they were not uh, taken on board in the talks with the Taliban. And without them being on board, you know, uh, dealing with, uh, trying to deal with the TTP through the Afghan Taliban is perhaps a mistake. Primarily, they should be dealt with their brethren that live across the border here in Pakistan. You know, the tribes that they belong to, the elders that they have, the families that they have there. Perhaps, you know, going uh, for talks, if we want to go that way, the proper way would be to go through the tribal people, the tribal elders, you know, the tribal, uh, you know, the new, newly emerged political class 
within the tribal areas, you know, that has resulted from the 20 years war there. You know, I'm referring to the youngsters, you know, to PTM, to NDM, you know, um, uh, bringing them closer, mollifying the aggrieved in the tribal areas. And then on the strength of that relationship, you know, going and talking to the uh, TTP in Afghanistan is perhaps the way forward, not the other way around. But you know. uh, Chaturna sir, uh, given, uh, and this is a, an excellent point, but let me ask you, uh, uh, most of the people that you are referring to are also victims of TTP. So how do you actually figure that they connect with their, uh, you know, victimizers while negotiating? I remember that while these talks were going on, there were lawmakers that, uh, that went from Pakistan to Kabul and met with the TTP's leadership. So is there a possibility to actually come up with a robust mechanism, if at all, to go for talks? I will be very, very honest, you know, when I answer your question. Frankly, you know, when it comes to the victimization of the tribal people of the tribal areas, if you ask them, and if you get an honest answer for them, perhaps they would point towards the Pakistani state as much as their victimizers, as they would point towards the Taliban. So, you know, for them, perhaps peace is, uh, definitely peace is, you know, uh, the, the, the primary demand that they have for their area. And for that, you know, there has to be at some level talks between the TTP and the Pakistani state. Mm. The other option is, you know, a prolonged war. I mean, we have seen the ability of the, uh, of the Afghan, of the TTP, you know, to operate in, diff in, you know, in a larger geographical area within Pakistan. They have mounted attacks in Balochistan recently. There have been attacks in Lahore. There have been attacks other way. I mean, we, can know, we know that they have sleeper cells in Karachi that they can rely upon right. if they decide to go that way. So with all of that in mind, perhaps, you know, instead of prolonged war, I mean, uh, we, would choose, we would choose rather have to have peace negotiations with them uh, going forward. Absolutely, and if perhaps yeah. there's, there's a lot in terms of the perceptions at the local front also that we need to deal with. Uh, Mr. Anwar, anything you'd like to add before we conclude the segment? Yes, I mean, I do not understand the discussion. I'm, I don't know what you think. First of all, uh, are, we with, are we willing to accept that supporting the Taliban was a mistake? Because I think it was a mistake. Are we willing to do that? I don't see that happening. And if even if we accept that, do we have the time and the resources to start a new process, process bring in new forces, engage with liberal Afghans? Are liberal Afghans willing to cooperate with us? Are, uh, do we have influence on the TTP? The, the, the Taliban, I mean, there are so many questions. It is such a complicated and confusing situation. Uh, I, didn't, I don't see Pakistan having too many options in Pakistan. We are in a mess. And I think that this is something that they realize in Washington, and that's why Washington has offered to work with Pakistan. I think the only option that we have left now is to work with the international, the international community, including the United States, and to see how much the entire, the entire international community put together can influence the Tal Taliban to change their ways and to keep terrorist groups out, out of Afghanistan. Working with the international community is the only option we have, but if we don't have the time or the resources to start an entirely new process. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, I just wanted to actually respond to what Saifullah Sahib was saying. You know, there, there is one concern that I have seen. I've, uh, actually, I, of course, I don't have the kind of exposure that Saifullah Sahib would have. He hails from the region. But I've also traveled, and well, with this fear uh, that someday TTP can come back, as uh, you know, gallivanting heroes, that also forces the local population to go for both sidism. There's n there are no both sides because there's a state and there's a non state actor. And the TTP has been victimizing so much that all the Masherans, they have been decapitated, their leadership has been totally vanquished. And because of that, there is this fear. I think if the Pakistani state uh, woos its own people, and then fight the terrorists, that will be a better option. But then you'll have to be very, very focused and targeted. And all this confusion that emerges somehow on our tele television sets, uh, where all the pundits are sitting and they're talking about, uh, you know, the um, other side being our but mm. others as well, that will have to stop. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sayyid Adnan Bukhari, uh, Mr. Anwar Iqbal, and of course, Mr. Saifullah Masood for joining us and being a part of the debate for this segment. But if you're still with me for the next one, we'll take a short break and continue the discussion. England and to Pakistan. After 17 long years, 
under Ben Stones, England are a resurgent side. But they are up against Barber's fighting unit on the Shaheen's home turf. This will be a test of nerves, strategy, strength and composure. Watch the historic Pakistan vs. England Test Series 2022 live and exclusively on PTV Sports HD. Kashmiris continue to live in a dire situation created by more than 1 million Indian troops. Modi has turned Kashmir into a giant open-air prison, denying even fundamental human rights to its residents. Killings of Kashmiri youths have become a routine affair of trigger-happy Indian troops. Indian troops arrest Kashmiris, invoking black laws against them and seizing private properties. World should come forward in a big way to rescue beleaguered people in occupied Jammu and Kashmir. After the big announcement on November 26th, as part of the culmination of the Hakiki Azadi March, the PTI chairman talked about the dissolution of assemblies in Punjab and KP and resignation from Sin and Balochistan. But after this uh, big announcement, uh, what has so far transpired is that we haven't really seen any decision coming out as to when that will actually happen. And what the PTI chairman is now saying is that the government uh, can possibly have talks with the PTI and talk about the date of the general, ele uh, general elections uh, earlier and so that is something that is going to prevent the PTI from dissolving the assemblies in Punjab and KP and that should be considered because 66% of the seats will be elected upon uh, if these two assemblies are dissolved. Uh, Farooq, given this current situation and the way that the PTI has talked about uh, their objectives since the ouster of the former Prime Minister, um, we have seen that they have fought on various fronts and many of them perhaps have been abandoned by now but in terms of the now the, the decision that has come out with regards to uh, the party also supporting the PTI chairman's stance on dissolving the assemblies why now the offer of talks with the government right um, I think that is uh, quite intriguing a question as any uh, you know uh, particularly uh, because Imran Khan sir today actually has uh, de uh, reiterated his uh, desire to uh, have a conditional dialogue and in which they decide what exactly might happen in the coming days. But that was not the biggest takeaway today, Sana. The mm -hmm. biggest uh, takeaway was the tone and tenor uh, on both sides. I saw the defense minister and home minister or interior minister statements. I saw information minister and other leadership of PTI's, uh, PMLN's uh, leadership as well. There seems to be a definite inclination towards dialogue mm. rather than uh, you see, uh, you usually have jaw jaw talk talk, right? Mm. So now it That's seems true. that we very clearly are heading towards talk. So what has changed in PTI's manner? I think that uh, you know finally they have started taking stock uh, because earlier it seemed that PTI's leadership was driven by one or two motives. Uh, you know, um, uh, 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 get your favorite uh, uh, appointments or then try to drag down the entire system and create some kind of violence. But now that they know that is not going to happen, they, are, they have set their eyes on next election. And in that, uh, I don't understand why PTI keeps on insisting, uh, except, except for the ego itself, that uh, they need uh, an early election. Honestly, uh, at this moment, the way things have been going because of the international economic crisis, if I were in Imran Khan's shoes, I would have definitely wanted uh, this uh, transition period to drag out mm. so that, uh, you know, economic conditions, whatever they are, 
I get the maximum leverage out of it and then I can say, look, when you displace me, uh, still then things haven't gone better or have they, right? Uh, that could have been the situation. But on the other side, it seems that within PTI's ranks also and its allies, there are voices which are silently resisting the idea of having an election now because then, uh, you know, uh, 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 they are going to be out of sync of the entire national process. If you are going to have a Punjab's uh, uh, election, it, it actually works both ways. Hmm. On one side, you can say that uh, uh, during the next national elections or general elections, you are going to have 66% of the vote bank out of the loop, right? Hmm. Because they have already voted. But remember that at that time, there will be an election uh, when the, these elections take place or uh, uh, these provincial assembly elections take place, mm. there will be a federal government and federal uh, parliament that can also oversee it. So it, it can contribute both ways. So why actually take risk? I'm glad at this moment that finally what, what has changed is not only the uh, um, uh, you know, tenor of uh, these leaders, but also the media's fuss because media keeps on trying to create a lot of dissension and a lot of fight. And finally, I see pundits, although for wrong reasons, concluding that they are going to be talks. Right. Um, and I understand all that. But in, in terms of uh, the, the current scenario, uh, why not have elections in KPN Punjab? Um, I understand what the PTI hopes to gain out of a call for earlier elections. Uh, but what it, does the political setup have to lose if there are elections on just KPN Punjab? Yeah. Um, uh, are you sure that if there is going to be an election and if there is going to be a new PTI government bo mm. in both uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Punjab, uh, whether the, the same CMs or chief ministers will be, will be returned to power? Mm. I don't think so. Mm. In Punjab, mm. uh, yeah, particularly the case is quite intriguing because uh, you know, PMLQ has a very small, small contingent. And they, that also is split wide open right in the middle because of the, uh, you know, intrapodal pull, pulls from the system. We have seen that playing out. Remember, mm. five people were on one side, five on the other. And because of that, uh, PMLQ uh, will not want to lose this leverage until it cultivates its con constituencies for the next election throughout the term. Similarly, in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa also, uh, the chief minister they, they, that they went with wasn't uh, Parvez Khattak. He was thought to be, do you know uh, what portfolio he had before he actually became chief minister in the previous setup? He was sports minister, right? And usually when you actually assign sports ministry to someone, you are actually con, uh, you know, confined to uh, sidelines. Exactly. And uh, the people don't think that they are too powerful. Uh, and that happened because uh, everyone wanted, especially Imran Hansa wanted somebody pliant there, mm. and they got it. But the chief minister on both sides will not want an LDA election. They would want it with everybody else. Uh, I have two concerns that I keep on pointing out. One, this conclusion or this kind of dissolve that we developed back in 2000s, that the country's assemblies are going to finish their complete tenure. Uh, but that is not my lookout, right? I keep on saying that if you are going to reduce the term, in the end, it will end up, uh, you know, weakening the democratic process. Right. But hey, I'm a voter. Every time you are going to ask me for a vote, I think that I'm going to have more leverage. So I'm mm. okay with any time of election. Mm. My concern is that these political parties, because they keep on bickering, they end up compromising their own leverage which is parliament and the democracy in the country. Absolutely, and we really hope that that is the focus of the political leadership. Thank you very much, Farooq, for being a part of the debate. Uh, we're um, off to the weekend, and so we hope that uh, we have good news coming in for the country and the world, and we'll join you once again on Monday at 10 p.m. Till then, have fun and um, stay tuned.